السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, mercy and blessings of Almighty God be on all of you and welcome to our second uh, uh, event in our uh, Understanding Islam 2012 organized by Serving Islam Team the second event is an interfaith dialogue between two uh, scholars of different faiths uh, the Christiani Christianity and Islam. Uh, first speaker, Dr. John Limon, will be speaking about the topic that has been announced, the concept of salvation in Christianity, and for 35 minutes. Then Dr. Bilal Phillips will speak about the same topic, the concept of salvation in Islam, for the same time, 35 minutes. Then we will open the remaining time for question and answers for both, to both uh, speakers. First speaker, Dr. John Limon. Uh, he's a missionary with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. He has lived in Asia, Taiwan, and Hong Kong for 27 years. So officially, you're a Chinese now. <laughs> Dr. Limon is an associate professor of church history and world religions at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Hong Kong and a consultant uh, to the Bridge and Dialogue Division of the Tao Fong Shan Christian Center. Dr. Limon received his doctorate in church history from Princeton Theological Seminary, USA. Our second speaker, Dr. Bilal Phillips, originally from Jamaica, uh, who has embraced Islam in the early 70s coming from Christian background into communism then ended as a Muslim he embarked on a spiritual academy journey uh, to the other side of the world seeking Islamic knowledge this journey took him to Saudi Arabia where he completed his BA in Islamic studies in Medina the city of Medina and an MA in Islamic theology in Riyadh after graduation from Medina, Dr. Bilal became a teacher of uh, Islamic studies for 10 years in a high uh, in a in an Islamic high school, Menarat in Riyadh, and a lecturer of Arabic and Islamic studies in um, in the American University in Dubai. Dr. Bilal Phillips have translated, commented, and authored over 50 published books on various Islamic topics. He has also edited and published the 56 books of Iman or faith uh, reading series for children and has presented plenty of programs in various uh, Islamic TV channels like uh, uh, Riyadh Channel 2 TV, Sharjah TV for 10 years as well as Peace TV in India, Hoda TV in Egypt, Islamic Channel UK and the Dean Show Chicago USA. Dr. Bilal Phillips also is the founder of Islamic Online University. He found on www.islamiconlineuniversity.com where free Islamic courses are being offered for over 50,000 registered users and over 204 uh, different countries of the world and uh, for which he was included in the Jordanian publication the, 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 five most, the 500 most influential uh, Muslims in the world. Please welcome both speaker, Dr. John Limon and Dr. Bilal. Let's give them a big hand of welcome. And now we will start with the first speaker of today's interfaith dialogue, Dr. John Limon. And the topic is the concept of salvation in Christianity and in Islam. Thank you. So, uh, sisters and brothers, assalamu alaikum. To start to speak about, um, first of all, I'll try to speak 35 minutes. I have no idea how, uh, I'll quit at 35 minutes. Uh, let's say that. To speak of salvation um, from a Christian point of view and probably from an Islamic point of view as well, uh, we must understand, first of all, that there is a need to be saved. Uh, if there were no need to be saved, there would be no need for salvation. And so the prior question about salvation that we need to discuss is, what is it 
that we're being saved from, and perhaps even what is it we're being saved for? What is the purpose of salvation? Now, Christianity bases the need for salvation on the book of Genesis. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, it teaches that God created all things, including human beings, uh, on the sixth day. And that in the beginning, all things were good. In fact, Genesis 1.31 says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. But of course, things didn't stay that way. And soon, the first people, known as Adam and Eve, had disobeyed God. And their relationship with God, which had once been so close, was now broken. And Adam and Eve were driven by God out of the Garden of Eden, away essentially from God's presence. Not so much that they had to leave the Garden, but that they had to leave God's, the special relationship that they had with God. And in a, in a sense also, it wasn't just that Adam and Eve were chased out of the garden by God, but that the entire created order fell into a state of separation from God. Uh, so that, in essence, is the problem with creation. We live in a state of separation from God. Now, the word sin is often used uh, for this to describe this condition. It's a very easy shorthand that we, we, we use. We talk about this sin or that sin or the state of sin. Uh, and we want to be saved from this condition of sin, this condition of separation from God, because our natural state is to be in communion with God, in natural communion with God. Um, we want to be saved. And that's what salvation is all about. And also, God wants to save us. Um, and so to put it simply, for Christians, salvation is the restoration of the original created order. The restoration of the original created order. Coming back into a relationship of love and trust between God and creation. So that answers the question, what are we saved from? We are saved from a state of estrangement from God. We are saved from a state of estrangement from God, and we're saved for a life of abundance in relationship for God, with, with God. So it's very simple. I could stop right here. This is what Christian uh, the concept of salvation is all about. But of course, this simple introduction to the topic of salvation is never enough, at least not for Christians. We love to argue about what salvation is all about. What do we have to do? We Christians, uh, for an, about the, the theological idea of salvation. So in the history of the church, which goes back about 2,000 years, uh, there's much, much more that's been said about the doctrine of salvation. Uh, but there are at least a couple of things that most Christians agree on. First, and most importantly, we agree that salvation is centered in one way or another. Salvation is centered on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me say that one more time. Almost all Christians would agree that salvation is centered on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And secondly, that Jesus Christ is the primary model of the life lived for and with God. But what does it mean that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the central point of salvation. It's a simple statement, but there's a lot packed into it. Who was Jesus to begin with? How could Jesus, this 
simple man from Palestine. How could Jesus make this tremendous thing happen, this thing of salvation, happen for all of humanity, for all of creation? Was he a very good man who had earned God's love and devotion and who had achieved his own salvation by living a, a good life? Is he only a model for us to follow in order to earn our own salvation? Or is he a superman, a person whom God has sent into the world to fight the devil and to fight sin and to overcome sin on behalf of humanity? Or was Jesus, in fact, God, the one and only God, the God of creation, the God who had walked in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Was Jesus God who had come to save creation? The Christian answer, after much discussion, discussion and disagreement in the early church, is that Jesus was indeed God. In fact, that Jesus is God who has brought about our salvation. The restoration of the right relationship with God for humanity and for all of creation. But why does it have to be this way? It doesn't actually. But why does this church say it must be this way? It is humanity that must be redeemed. It is humanity that has fallen into sin. Therefore, in order for humanity to be saved, humanity must pay the price for the sin committed by Adam and Eve. It must be humanity that overcomes the state of separation. That's why we talk about Jesus not only as true God and true man, uh, as, as true God, but also as true human being. So there must be two sides. It must be humanity that overcomes the separation and returns and repents uh, of this condition of sin. But because of the separ state of separation, because of the state of sin, humanity is not capable of repairing this relationship with God. Our sin is too great. Our separation from God is too great. And so it must be God who takes the initiative. The only one who can overcome this great divide between God and God's creation is God's self. And that is what God does in Jesus Christ. Jesus is both completely and truly human and completely and truly God. And this being the case, reconciliation between creation and God becomes possible. But now we come to something in Christian theology called atonement. Because we can say that Jesus came into the world that Jesus was both truly God and truly human being. But, and that because of this, uh, we are brought into a right relationship with God. But how did it happen? What is the mechanism that causes this to happen? And that's what we mean by atonement. Uh, the Christian concept of atonement. Atonement means being at, it's like, the old English word means at one meant, to being with, at one with God, and that's what we are seeking. So how does, what is the mechanism that allows this to happen? It means at one with God, but is primarily concerned with how God saved us in Jesus Christ. We know that salvation centers on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We know that Jesus is both truly God and truly human. But what was it exactly that happened on the cross? What was it exactly that happened 
at the resurrection. And interestingly, Christianity does not have a single answer for this. We have several possibilities. And I want to talk about a few of those possibilities for atonement, the definition of atonement. One of those possibilities is that Jesus was a ransom paid by God to Satan. So in other words, if someone is, someone is uh, kidnapped and, and is taken away into hiding, the person who kidnaps them uh, writes to their family and says, I want a certain amount of money and then I'll let them go. That's called, that amount of money, that payment is called a ransom. And one of the theories of atonement says that the atonement was a ransom paid to Satan by God in order to free humanity uh, and to bring humanity back into the right relationship with God. Satan, the evil one, in this theory, had control of the souls of all people following their fall into sin. And that in order for them to be freed from Satan's control, a price had to be paid. God offered his only begotten son, Jesus, for payment of this ransom. And Satan accepted this payment. But God tricked Satan. Because Satan did not know when he accepted Jesus Christ as payment that Jesus Christ could not be controlled by death, that Jesus Christ was sinless. And so in the end, God raised Jesus from the dead, overcame death, and by doing this, by taking back this ransom through the resurrection, Satan's control over humanity and creation was ended. The one who had been kidnapped, humanity, and Jesus were returned to the right relationship with God. It's okay. It's okay. 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 I'll start over. <laughs> okay. So Satan's control of humanity was ended and salvation was achieved. This is one understanding of the atonement uh, theory uh, in Christianity. Mark, in the, book, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark in the Bible, in the New Testament, chapter 10, verse 45 says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in 1 Timothy 2, 5-6, it says, for there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. So there, there are many things in, in the Bible that, that say different things, and that's the way these different uh, under, these concepts, these theories of atonement arose. Another one is, a very popular one is called, and is similar to the first one, it's called the Christus Victor, uh, theory of atonement. And in this theory, uh, by Christ's death, the powers of evil which control humanity are defeated through Christ's life and identification in the flesh with all humanity and with creation. And his death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection, Jesus Christ defeats Satan. God in, in Christ overcomes death and overcomes the power of Satan at the same time. It's not a ransom that's paid to Satan. It is a liberation of creation through incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. A third theory of atonement is called the penal substitution theory. And this theory says that all of humanity deserve God's punishment, but Jesus Christ, 
that is, God in Jesus Christ, chose to be punished himself in place of humanity. So there was a justice that had to be met. God's justice had to be met. And there was only one person who could do that, uh, who, could, who could meet the justice of God, and that was God's self. Um, Christ was substituted for all of humanity. Now remember when I say Christ, Christians believe that Jesus Christ was God. So if, if I don't put those two together, it's understood. Jesus Christ took on all the sin of humanity and died for that sin on the cross. Humanity was thereby able to have access to salvation because the price for sin, the penalty for sin, had been paid by God. Humanity and all of creation can be reconciled then to God. John 12, 27 says, And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, Jesus says. It is for this reason, his upcoming crucifixion, that I have come to this hour. And then in another passage in John says, No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And there are others. A fourth theory is, uh, and that's been widely accepted by Christians, is called the satisfaction theory of atonement. The satisfaction theory teaches that Christ suffered as a substitute on behalf of humanity. And this sounds like all the others. Uh, through the sinfulness of humanity, though, rather than paying a price uh, for the justice of God, uh, paying a penalty, in uh, Adam and Eve, in humanity's rebellion against God, God was dishonored. And so Jesus Christ, through Christ's infinite merit of his sinless life and death, satisfied the demands of God's honor when he was crucified and died. And so God's honor was restored. Jesus' death on the cross was the, was the ultimate act of obedience to the will of God. But this act by Jesus Christ was more than was required by God. Therefore, there was a surplus of merit that could be applied to all humanity. Christ's surplus covers humanity's deficit. Jesus Christ is not punished in this theory as in a penal model, but Jesus Christ suffers for us and restores God's honor, and humanity is saved. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him, God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And others. So these are four examples uh, that I've given you of the atonement, different atonement models. They all attempt to explain or to provide a model for the meaning of the work of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. But the question then arises, what does any of this have to do with me personally? Why should it matter to me? How am I going to participate in this atonement in order to achieve salvation, or in order that salvation may be accomplished? How am I to obtain this salvation that Jesus Christ has made possible for me? Once again, there are several possibilities. The first one is that the work of Jesus Christ has universal effect. Because of what God has done in Jesus Christ, all of humanity has been saved. Salvation has been achieved for all of humanity and for all of creation. It is a fact. Uh, you don't need to be a Christian in order to, to be saved. So, it's not something that I do. It's something that Christ did. And it is, a, it is the state in which I live. Uh, all of humanity has been brought into a right relationship with God. 
Now the problem is that this may seem, not seem apparent to us. When we look at the world, we see a very sinful world, if we want to use those words. We see a wor world in conflict. We see a world uh, in which people hate each other, kill each other, uh, despise each other. So how could it be that Jesus has accomplished salvation for all of the world? How can this be that this is a cosmic reality? The explanation for that is that we have achieved salvation through Jesus Christ, but we don't recognize this fact. We continue to live as we lived before. It is available to us. This new life is available to us if we'll only live in the right way, follow Christ, uh, bring Christ into our lives. It's, it's all there. It's all been achieved for us, and it's waiting for us to enjoy. Uh, but we refuse to accept it. We want to live our lives in the old reality rather than the new reality. 2 Corinthians 5.17 uh, and talking about the universal understanding of salvation, says that, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, for since death came through a human being, meaning Adam, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, all are made alive in Christ. Another possibility for how I'm going to uh, obtain this salvation, make it active in my life, is, um, excuse me, yes, the, this, this salvation has been uh, placed on a table. Okay, this is the, another idea. That the salvation that Jesus Christ has achieved has, has been placed on a table. It is a gift to us. Something that God has achieved through Christ. It is a gift that's been laid on the table. But in order to make this real in my life, I have to reach out and take it. Uh, I have to, in a sense, ask for this gift. It's, it's been given to me. I have to come and, and take it. I have to do something to receive that gift. And how do I reach out and claim this gift? Classically, the answer to this is, I have to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior by my own will, by my own decision. I come and accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And in a sense, that is my own reaching out and accepting this gift that Christ offers to me. I must have faith in Christ as my Savior. In the New Testament book of Acts, uh, a man asked the Apostle Paul this question, what must I do to be saved? And the response is very clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, that's that aspect of faith that I must consciously and with my own will achieve in order to uh, make this gift real in my life. Otherwise, the gift just sits there wrapped in pretty paper and it has no meaning for me. I must believe and claim the salvation prepared by Christ. A third possibility is similar to the one just mentioned, except in this understanding, faith is not something that I do of my own will. Faith is also a gift from God. God is gracious. God is merciful. So God gives us the gift of faith as well as the gift of salvation. And through that gift of faith, we're able to accept this gift of salvation that waits for us. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. But of course, the big question when discussing the topic of salvation is, what I talked about earlier, what does this really mean for me personally? 
what most of us really are, the question we want answered more than anything else, more than all the things that I've talked about so far, is what's going to happen to me when I die? Where am I going to go? What is the end result of salvation? Yes, I want to be reconciled to God. Yes, I want there to be a new creation. But where will I go when I die? Heaven or hell? Interestingly, the Bible does not give a definite answer to this question. Christians talk a lot about heaven and hell and who's going there and who's not going there. But the Bible doesn't really talk about heaven and hell very much. And even when it does talk about heaven and hell, it's not very clear. Heaven is mentioned, but not in any comprehensive way. Hell is also mentioned, but also not in any comprehensive way. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are mentioned numerous times. In, math, in the Gospel of Matthew, who almost exclusively talks about the kingdom of God, excuse me, the kingdom of heaven, tells us, we usually think of, in, in, in very popular Christian understanding, heaven is up there and hell's down there. But uh, Matthew tells us in his Gospel that heaven is not someplace in the sky. It's not someplace far away. Matthew 3, 2 says, the kingdom of heaven has come near to us. It's not someplace out there. It's someplace very close to us. Concerning the kingdom of God, in fact, Luke 17, 21 says that the kingdom of God is actually among us and, in fact, is within us. And the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 17 says, what the kingdom of God is is not a place at all. The kingdom of God is justice and peace in the Holy Spirit. The Bible is also concerned with uh, eternal life. Eternal life is mentioned in, in addition to heaven and uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And we often mistake, when in reading the Bible, uh, this idea of eternal life with heaven. Uh, in John chapter 6, verse 47, it says, those who believe in Jesus will have eternal life. And of course, it doesn't say what we're to believe in Jesus. It just puts it very uh, plainly, believe in Jesus and you'll have eternal life. But another place in the Gospel of John says, those who eat Jesus' body and drink Jesus' blood, in other words, referring to the Holy Communion, have eternal life. And another place in John, it says, and this is eternal life, that you may know, that, that they may know you, in other words, Jesus is saying to his disciples uh, and, to, and talking to the Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That is eternal life. Not that that will give you eternal life, not that you will go on and live eternally in some place far away in the sky, but this is eternal life, knowing God the Father and knowing Jesus Christ the Son. So after all of this, what is the Christian understanding of salvation? Well, it depends largely on what you believe. And there are many options, as I've just outlined. But basically we may say this. Christians understand salvation to be reconciliation with God. Reconciliation with God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Now it's time uh, with Dr. Bilal Phillips to address us on the same topic, the concept 
of salvation in Christianity and Islam. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah. And may Allah's peace and blessings be on all of the prophets of Allah. I'd like to begin the presentation of the Islamic understanding of salvation with the same story concerning Adam and Eve. However, the story as it is presented in the Quran differs with that which we find in the Bible. It differs from the perspective that God knowing all things before they take place. I guess your microphone is closer. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. They give me an extra one. It's okay. No problem. Yeah. The um, the concept of Adam and Eve in the garden being given instructions not to eat from one particular tree a tree which is not defined but that God knew before giving the instruction to Adam and Eve that they both would disobey. He was not giving them an instruction which he didn't already know what the consequence was. So since he knew that they were going to disobey him, he gave them the means of atonement or salvation from the sin right from the very beginning. So when they disobeyed him and ate, they turned back to him in repentance based on words of repentance which he had taught them. Allah, God, had taught Adam and Eve how to repent from sin so that they could remove that sin from themselves. And that is exactly what they did. They turned back to God, asked His forgiveness. The words of repentance are mentioned in the Quran and God forgave them. So, the story of Adam, rather than being one in which Adam and Eve disobey God, and through their disobedience, they break their relationship with God, not only for themselves, but for all humanity. And that the sin which they had committed would furthermore be inherited generation after generation. Instead, the story of Adam and Eve represents the basic model of human life. That human beings are all born sinless. As Adam and Eve were created sinless, every human being is born free from sin. And it is the acts that they do that remove them from that sinless state. And as they 
commit sins, they have within their own grasp a means for salvation from that sin. Therefore, there was no need for any other sacrifice to purify human beings from sin because it is within the grasp of each and every human being. Also contained in that is that each person is responsible for his or her own sin. From the Islamic perspective, no one can bear the sin of any other. Nor does anyone inherit the sin of any other. Each one is responsible for his or her sin and must seek salvation themselves for it. No one can achieve salvation from, from, for them. And this is, of course, very clearly stated in the Quran. It is not uh, a question of philosophical discussions amongst Muslims or Muslim scholarship, etc. It is clearly stated that each individual is uh, responsible for sin and responsible to such a degree that no one can bear the, the burden of anyone else. Furthermore, what we find uh, when we look into the other scriptures, and I should just mention that we believe as Muslims that this concept was shared by all prophets of God. This was not something uh, newly brought by Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, but it was taught also by Jesus and it was taught by Moses and by all who were sent by God to humankind. The Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said that one who repents from sin is like one without sin. This is the power of repentance. Repentance involves turning back to God. The term used for repentance in Islam is tawbah. Tawbah is the turning back, returning to that original state. The, the original state of being sinless. So through tawbah, through repentance, one returns to that state. And uh, it is, as I, as I mentioned in the first place, that uh, God knew that uh, Adam and Eve would disobey him, which is why the uh, knowledge of how to free themselves from sin was given to them right from the very beginning and remained a part of the teachings of all of the prophets until the last prophet of God. You can find in Ezekiel a reference to this, actually in the Old Testament. I was just looking for it somehow. I think I misplaced the paper. I haven't memorized that verse. But uh, where it states that, that um, the deeds of the sinner are borne by the sinner and none can uh, bear the sin. The father doesn't bear the sin of the son, nor, the, nor does the son bear the sin of the father, and so on and so on. So on. This exists actually text in the Old Testament itself. And this is a part of the uh, original teachings uh, handed down through Moses from Abraham and the others. The idea that each person is responsible for their sin. And of course, for the average person, this makes sense. Why should I be held accountable for the sins of those who came before me? What did I have to do with their sins? And this is the fundamental uh, teaching in Islam that Adam and Eve 
not only were given forgiveness for the sin, but that Adam, from the Islamic perspective, became the first prophet of God. Not only was he the first human being, but he was also the first prophet of God. So, each human being who falls into sin has this basic model to follow. You commit sins, as the prophet said, all of Adam's descendants constantly commit sins. But the best of those who commit sins are those who constantly turn back to God in repentance. This is the uh, Islamic teaching in this regard. Um, I could mention also, just for clarification, that the issue of, of um, salvation from sin through repentance is not merely an individual saying, God forgive me and that's it. That in fact, uh, it requires a number of conditions to be fulfilled before that repentance is considered to be real and acceptable to God. The first of the conditions is that one is conscious of God in seeking his forgiveness. That it is not just a ritual, uh, a blind ritual, say like a confession where you would go and say to a priest, uh, I've done this, so and so and so, and you're forgiven, forgiven my son, you know, put a few uh, coins in the plate, say a few Hail Marys, and okay, that's, you're, you're now forgiven. Uh, this is a ritual. Or like for Muslims, you know, a person says, Astaghfirullah, which means, God forgive me. You know, maybe you say it so many times, and the Prophet, he recommended that we should uh, seek forgiveness from God a hundred times a day or more, if possible. You know, we should... Uh, this is this is a, this is a statement. But if we are just saying that statement without a consciousness of God in it, it's just a ritual. Then of course, right from the very beginning, no salvation will take place. We may go through the motions, etc., but no change will take place in our state with regards to God, nor in, in our state with regards to ourselves. Following the the first step, we have the second step, which is that it should take place immediately. Immediacy is critical. That one doesn't say or seek God's forgiveness while continuing to do the sin. You know, smoking, for example, which is a sin in Islam, though there are many Muslims who smoke, to say, you know, oh God, forgive me as you take your next cigarette, yeah, it's pointless. Yeah, you're conscious of God, but you know, if this isn't stopping, then you haven't made that effort. It's just ritual. You've stated it. So immediacy is one of the conditions. And of course, this is stated very clearly in the Quran, and I should mention, I guess, to uh, put some text there with it uh, in terms of remembrance uh, without doubt it is in the remembrance of Allah that hearts find rest that that state of repentance from sin which produces that state of peace within self oneself or one realizes salvation. That can only happen with the remembrance of God. And he also stated in the fourth chapter, verse 17, Surah Nisa, Surely Allah will forgive those who do sins in ignorance and quickly turn in repentance. 
These Allah will forgive, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. And uh, we can find in the third chapter, Ali Imran, verse 133, hasten in the race for forgiveness from your Lord. So, uh, turning back quickly uh, and giving up, which we could call cessation, actually giving up that particular sin, stopping it, is among the initial uh, requirements for repentance to have the effect on the human being of salvation, saving him, re removing the sin from himself, acceptable to God. It is also to be considered among the conditions what is known as exoneration, that if the sin for repentance, if this sin involves the rights of other human beings, then their rights must be restored for the repentance to also take effect. You stole somebody's car, you felt bad about it, but you're still driving around saying, God, I for please forgive me for what I've done. You know? But you're still driving. No. This is somebody else's property. Yes. The one who repents from sin is like one without sin. But if you still got his property, you're still hanging on to the sin. You must return it. And if, for example, a person has stolen property and they've had it for years, finally they woke up. This was a sin. I really should not have taken that property. What to do now? I can't even remember who I took it from. Right? You know? So what do you do now? Well, in that, such a case, then you are required to give it away in charity. You know? Not charity meaning that you're seeking reward from God for this act of charity, but to a charitable body that can utilize it for the benefit of people in general because this, that's not charity from yourself. You're just trying to remove the, the remnants of the sin. You're just clearing yourself of what you had no right to. And among the conditions is that of sorrow. That one should feel sorrow and regret. In fact, one of the statements of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, he had said that repentance is sorrow. That's the essence of it. That if one doesn't feel sorry about what one has done, then you're going to do it again. That's for sure. So that state of sorrow and regret has to be real. We have to feel it. Otherwise, we'll be back doing that same sin that we sought forgiveness from at the first opportunity we find before ourselves. Added to that is righteous deeds. Allah said, if any of you does evil in ignorance, then repents and makes amends. He is oft forgiving, most merciful. He repents and makes amends. These amends, these are good deeds that one does to uh, make up for the evil. In another verse, he said, Surely I will repeatedly forgive those who repent, believe and do righteous deeds, and then accept right guidance. And in other verses, God has even gone on to say, that for those who do that, who repent, uh, do righteous deeds, that even their evil deeds can be converted to good deeds, becoming good deeds on their scale of judgment, uh, in their scale on the day of judgment. So, the, and of course, this depends on the level of that repentance of the individual. The highest level is where those deeds become. Are, are turned into uh, righteous deeds. So uh, those represent the major steps that must be fulfilled for repentance. Righteous deeds 
having the power to remove sin can be found in prayers the prophet had said may God's peace and blessing be upon him that between prayers from prayer to prayer sins are removed by those prayers themselves fasting also removes sin from Ramadan to Ramadan sins are removed giving charity removes sin all the major good deeds righteous deeds have the power to remove sins even as the prophet had said may God's peace and blessing be upon him that if a believer suffers harm and is patient with it that removes sin also even the thorn which sticks the, into the foot of the believer removes sin which is why for Muslims the idea of euthanasia for a person who is suffering dying they're in pain you know some people have the idea that you know if, if uh, life isn't pleasant anymore quality, the, of, life. quality yeah. of life then it's better to just let me die you know let me go from the Islamic perspective no because that uh, pain that one suffers if one suffers it patiently with God having an opportunity to come closer to God this removes that sins from the individual so as Muslims it is not permissible for us to practice euthanasia or to seek uh, to die you know the most that we are allowed to say as the Prophet may God's peace and blessing be upon him taught us is oh God if living is for me is better then let me live and if dying is better then let me die that's as far as we can say but oh God take my life now let me die I want to die no we're not allowed to do that so summing up the concept of salvation in Islam is that it is in the hands of each and every human being it is not a concept which evolved as took place in Christianity and which led to a variety of different possibilities as to what was happening and what was taking place the early followers of Christ had other views James the brother of Jesus who headed the Jerusalem church after Jesus' passing didn't hold that view Arius from Alexandria in those first centuries many didn't hold that view so this was a view held by some which evolved and, and, and changed in its form and its, and its uh, principles as time passed not a, not a, a view which comes from the lips of Christ himself mostly from the writings of Paul mostly from the writings of Paul whether it's Corinthians Galatians all of these are letters written by Paul and in it he enunciated this new concept the current belief in Christianity of salvation through belief in the divinity of Jesus Christ may God's peace and blessing be upon him on his death and his resurrection this was a product of theological historical argument which was eventually forced on the Christian world of its time it was not the common view 
And it became the common view as it was forced on the rest of Christianity, or what was referred to as Christianity. On the contrary, the Muslim view is a view which matches the teachings of all of the earlier prophets, whether it's Abraham, Moses, etc. And we believe as Muslims that it was also the view of Jesus Christ himself. He held that same view. Salvation is in the hands of each and every human being. Making it accessible. Making it so accessible that the issue would never be raised as is oftentimes raised to Christians. Well, if Jesus, the death and resurrection of Jesus and accepting him as God incarnate provides for us salvation, what about those before Jesus? This is the big question which is raised time and time again. For Christians, basically the answer is God knows best. You know, he knows best what happens to them. But the simple answer is that all of those earlier prophets who are prophets of God and all of their followers who were believers in God, who did righteous deeds and the simple answer is they achieved salvation by turning back to God. And that is the essence of the Islamic point of view. Salvation is in the hands of each and every one of us. But of course, it has to be sincere. It has to be with regret. It has to be with giving up what it is that has brought us to that state. And I would just close saying that I would hope that each and every one of us who are here this afternoon would turn back to God and ask His forgiveness because only He ultimately can forgive sin. Thank you. There's one here, please. I one see, sister. I see several hands. I just let me say to begin with, all of those who would like to convert to Christianity, just meet me in the back. <laughs> if that's what you were going to ask, yeah, it's just in that corner. Yeah. We have a swimming pool at the back. <laughs> <laughs> swimming pool in the back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Where is the first question? We will uh, hear. Okay, coming. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. John Lemon. Um, there's one question for me that uh, you said before that uh, in the Bible from John and Paul, if I don't uh, mm -hmm. make a mistake, mm -hmm. that's mentioned that um, there's the heaven and the hell is not clearly stated, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, in my uh, perspective, there's, uh, our purpose of life is at the end is we have to go to the left or to the right. This is the, for me, it's the right is heaven, the left is uh, hell. So it, does it mean that if you say that in the Bible that's, that's not clear, does it mean that the Bible is not complete yet? Thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, so the, is the Bible complete or not? And that's a very good question because I, in most religions, there is a... Uh, you have what we call the canon, which is the, the, the uh, accepted list of books that we have you know, in, in any scripture, in the Quran or in the, in the Christian Bible or in the, the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and that question always arises. Is, is the canon open or closed? Can we add to it uh, or is it final? Um, I think in Islam and Christianity, we both say that that's, it's closed. Uh, most people would say that. 
So I think that there, there probably there will, there will not be anything in Christianity you won't add to the 66 books that we recognize as Holy Scripture. It's complete in that sense. But is our understanding of it complete? No. Our understanding is not complete. Um, we, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't give us, I, from my point of view, uh, let me say that, yeah, if you go out of this room and talk about Christian uh, concept of salvation, please say, this is John Lamont's understanding of Christian salvation. But uh, that we can, we can never understand, we will never understand completely everything scripture tells us. And so that's why uh, in Christianity there are many different understandings of what the Bible says. Uh, so it, it is complete, but our understanding is incomplete. Okay? Next question to Dr. Bilal Phillips. Next question. We will give the preference to non-Muslim to pose question to Muslim scholar and vice versa. Um, right, can you hear me? I just want to ask, it's, it's a question to either of you really. Um, in Islam, is there the concept that only you can only be saved or achieve salvation if you're a Muslim? And the same in Christianity, can you only be saved or be achieve salvation if you're a Christian? And if the answer to either of these is yes, then how do you account for people of different beliefs or no beliefs at all and what will happen to them? Thank you. Well, uh, I think from the very beginning, uh, we should uh, understand from the Islamic perspective that all of the prophets of God were Muslims. We don't consider uh, Islam to be the third of the Ibrahimic faiths, as it's or Ibra you know, Abrahamic faiths. Uh, perspective. No, we believe it was all one. Jesus was a, a Muslim. Uh, Moses was a Muslim. Abraham was a Muslim. Adam was a Muslim. The religion of God, as it states quite clearly in the Quran, inna dina inda Allahi al Islam. Indeed, the religion in the sight of God is Islam. Islam meaning submission to the will of God. That Abraham, that Adam was commanded to submit his will to God by not eating from the tree. That was the essential uh, principle here. That was the religion of Adam. So for us, we have no problem. People who may have been called Christians but who were true followers of Jesus from the first century, for example, first two centuries, first four centuries before the Trinitarian concept was forced on the uh, objectors, you know, uh, those would be considered from the Muslim perspective as being Muslims. They may have been looked at as heretical Christians later on or as dissenting Christians earlier on. But from our perspective, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, who led the, uh, the Jerusalem church and those who followed him, uh, known also as the Ebionites, uh, their belief was that God was one, Jesus was a prophet of God, and we consider them to be maintaining the original teachings of Jesus, and they are Muslims. So for us, uh, all the prophets, and we believe that, uh, as Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had said, that over 124,000 prophets were sent to humankind, to every nation and tribe. So wherever these prophets went and people followed them, they became Muslims. They have the right to salvation, as all human beings have who follow the teachings of the prophets who were sent to them, originally being, of course, teachings coming from God. Next question to Dr. John Limon. Well, let me, let, could I, I answer her question? Uh, for, uh, you ask a question about, yeah, so 
Uh, in many ways, I agree very uh, completely. I mean, I'll, well, I can't in many ways agree completely, but <laughs> I, in many ways, I agree with what Dr. Bilal says. Uh, but, uh, and, and I would say that there is no requirement to be a Christian uh, for salvation. Uh, there in nowhere in the Christian uh, scripture does it require one to become a Christian. Um, it requires one to be, in a sense, a Muslim. One who submits themselves totally to the will of God. That's really what Jesus came to preach and teach. And so if, if you're using the word Muslim to mean one who submits themselves completely to the will of God, then that's what really Jesus came to teach. And uh, not to be a Christian. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think it, it is the same thing uh, Dr. Bilal was saying. Uh, you're not taught to be a Muslim. You're taught to submit yourself to the will of God. And, I, and, and my understanding of Christianity is the same way. Yeah, there's no requirement to be a Christian. But to have faith in Jesus Christ uh, as the, you know, the incarnation of God is something that we, we believe. Yeah. Now I'm confused. Next question goes to who? Yeah. <laughs> to, to Dr. John Lemond, one question. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I just want to go back to your uh, question. Uh, where am I in all this in the concept yeah. of salvation of yeah. Christianity? Because there are many theories. So, uh, um, for example, I can go through the whole thing without being involved. Uh, God has uh, punished us for, him, uh, for the sins, has to punish us for sins, and then he dies for it, and then afterwards I can take any of the theories, like uh, not to be involved, like the universal salvation, or, yes. uh, or uh, he gives me the gift of faith. Um, so I'm not involved in any of this. Um, shouldn't this be more clear? In, uh... Uh, maybe it should be, but it's not. Uh, it's not more clear. It's, uh, you have a choice. Now, some, let's, you know, will, will you go to heaven? I mean, will you be with God? Will you be reconciled with God if you believe in eternal salvation? Well, the people who believe in that believe so. Uh, another group would say, no, that's not the case. You have to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and accept Him uh, in that way before, you know, this can happen. So the, the groups disagree, but, uh, but it's, it's not more clear. In Christianity, um, perhaps we got some of this from Judaism. Judaism, one of the, one of the great arts of Judaism is argument. Uh, always you know, talking about these things. There's nothing is ever actually decided as a fact, but there's argument that goes on, and, and you learn from the paradox of, of different views. Uh, and I think you know, there's a little bit of this in Christianity, too. And it depends on who you talk to. Um, some Christians would say there's no doubt. Very clear. This is what you have to do. Others would say it differently. Yeah. Mm. Next, Dr. Bilal Phillips. You have one here at the back, thank you. Thank you for your lectures, very interesting. Um, I was born and raised into a Christian family. Uh, we attended regular Christian worship. Uh, I have attended Islamic uh, teaching and have great respect for the Islamic teaching and principles and peoples and, and cultures. I have not converted or reverted to uh, to Islam. If I leave this world today, <laughs> if I did not convert to Islam, having been given the opportunity to learn and teach about it, uh, you know, wh do I have salvation from a, from an Islamic point of view? And I'm cheating here, but can I also ask the same question from a Christian point of view? I would say, uh, of course, in terms of, um, because when you're saying, do you have salvation, it means, are you going to heaven? Or are you going to hell? And as a Muslim, we know we cannot specify about any individual that he or she is going to heaven or hell. Because we don't know what is within, inside people, 
uh, what their relationship with God is, what God may forgive that we might think, well, uh, you know, is unforgivable, and all these other issues. So, I mean, I would say, if you, if you ask me that, you're living before me, I would ask you, why? Okay, if you have understood Christianity, and you have understood Islamic teachings, or you think you've understood it, uh, why is it that you wouldn't uh, convert? I would ask you that. And then you would tell me, well, I, not be because of this. Or dep it depends. If you told me, well, it's because actually my family, uh, I couldn't really deal with the pressure which would come if I converted, then I would say that then that choice is what you are going to be responsible for before God. Because obviously, if you believe that Islam was in fact the truth, and you didn't accept it because of your family, then it means your family has become more important to you than God. And which is actually what happened in the case of the uncle of Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, Abu Talib, well known, he had raised the Prophet in his early years, etc. On his deathbed, when he was invited to accept uh, the faith, and his other brothers were telling him, are you going to disgrace the family? Are you going to dishonor the tribe? Are you going to this, 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 and this? And he decided to go with the custom and the culture of his people, though he knew it was wrong. Then the Prophet himself said, Abu Talib will be in hell. He would have the least punishment of the people of hell, but he would be in hell. Thinking at the same time that he is receiving the greatest punishment of anybody else. So, to say, would you achieve salvation or not? As I said, I would ask, try to get to the bottom of what your actual concepts are, where you are. If it were that you said, well, it is just that I believe Jesus was God. That's just the sticking point. For me, I believe Jesus was in fact God. Well, I say, well, if you die in that state, then you would be lost. Because from the Islamic perspective, God is God and man is man. Man is a creation of God and not God. For God to become man is for God to become his own creation. Human beings cannot become God because they are created. They have beginnings, they have ends. God has certain attributes which are unique to himself, which distinguish himself from his creation. So if you did, died believing that God was an animal, a rock, a star, a human being, then you have lost all. Unless you were from those people who did not receive the true message of the prophets, the true message of Jesus, the true message of Moses, Abraham, etc. You were uh, retarded, you were in some part of the world where the message just didn't get there. Then Muslim belief is that at the time of resurrection, you would be brought back separately along with all the other people who were in positions where they did not hear the message of the prophets and you would be given the message, given instructions to follow. Those who follow would go on to paradise. Those who did not would go on to hell. Uh, you said you want to hear also the Christian, Christian side view. If you believe in Jesus as God, yes, you'll go to heaven. No, it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, come over to our side. Uh, the swimming pool is ready. Yeah, the swimming pool is ready. No, it's... Um, but, as, again, the Bible says many things. But one of the things Jesus said uh, is uh, a lawyer asked him a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And, uh, and the lawyer, uh, and Jesus answered, what does the scripture say? And the, the lawyer responded, 
love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And that's it. Uh, to, be a, to be a Christian, no, to be a Muslim, to be any religion, no requirement. Just to love God and love your neighbor. Uh, that's one answer uh, to that question. Mm -hmm. But I can't, whether you'll go to heaven or hell tonight if you die, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question should go to Dr. John Limon. I ask uh, Rev. John Lemon. Can you stand up so we can see? Yeah, my question is that uh, does God need to have a physical relationship with human being in order to have a son to save people from sin? And salvation, and the next question follows no, that. One is that question. Uh, one question. Okay, that is my question. Does Jesus, I mean, does God need to have a physical relationship with humanity in order to save humanity? Does God need a son in order to have, to save? Uh, no, no. That, the answer to that is no. God does not need to have a son. God could do anything God wants to do. But what God chose to do, from a Christian perspective, is to enter into... Uh, to the life of humanity, incarnation, that's a central idea for Christianity, in the form of Jesus Christ, and Jesus was called the Son of God. Uh, and so that's the way, from a Christian perspective, that's the way God planned it. God did not need to do that, but that's the way God decided to do it. Next question to Dr. Bilal Phillips. Thank you. Uh, well, I would hope God in, in heaven is uh, very merciful and full of compassion and to all Christians and all Muslims will be sal uh, find salvation and go to heaven. Uh, but I had one question, uh, with, uh, Dr. Phillips, uh, regarding Jesus. Um, I believe in the, in the Bible and in the Holy Quran, uh, Jesus is uh, acknowledged as the uh, son of Mary by virgin birth and uh, what comes to my mind then the Jesus I would think then is must be the only human being ever to be born from a virgin and I can't think of another that ever, ever happened uh, so when I think of the Jesus as possibly being the son of God uh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and I was, my question is really is is it also the Muslim belief that Jesus is conceived through the virgin birth by the Holy Spirit? That's the question, yes. I'll ask another one later. I believe also in Islam, Jesus is the mightiest prophet who will, only prophet who will come again. Thank you. We had uh, one question also. Right? <laughs> um, the idea of Jesus being born without a father yeah in the Quran you know it's it doesn't leave any room for doubt in biblical uh, texts well Joseph was there uh, but in the Islamic text no mention of Joseph at all she's not even married you know, so we have no doubt about Jesus being born without a human uh, intervention or any other intervention. In fact, it's so it's so critical that for a Muslim to deny that Jesus was born uh, without a father actually is a statement of disbelief it actually takes a person it makes a person a heretic having left islam and among christian theologians i mean there's a lot more room because i do and i met and i studied with christian theologians who didn't believe in the uh, immaculate conception 
but they were still considered Christian theologians. But in Islam, it's actually very, you know, black and white here. There's no flexible room here. So it is very critical. But at the end of it, Eve was born from Adam. I don't know of any other woman who was born from a man. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, I would have to accept if somebody was going to argue that, well, maybe Eve was also God incarnate in a female form. I would have to, I, if I was going to use that argument to go for Jesus, I would have to act, say that for, for Eve. And even Eve's birth from Adam is beyond Jesus' birth from Mary because he still came through the regular channels that we know of, you know? And even modern scientists were talking about how they could stimulate a female ovum and cause it to start to replicate without the agency of a sperm egg. You know, I've read papers on it, but have they done it? They haven't. But that possibility exists, meaning that the, f the female ovum contains enough a DNA, etc., to produce. Some of the animals of the earth do produce, do reproduce that way. So the birth of Jesus is looked at from the Islamic perspective as being the completion of the four methods by which human beings are created. Human being created without a father and son, because then we have to go back to Adam, because this is what the Quran says when talking about Jesus, that look at Adam. He was born without a father and son. He was created by God to bring home the idea that this is just a mode of creation. God created Adam without father and mother. God created Eve without a mother. God created all human beings with a father and a mother. And God created Jesus without a father. Doesn't take any of them out of the state of humanity. Thank you. Thank and, and, and just let me add just a final point. That from the Muslim perspective, when we say God can do all things, we do put a condition that God can do all things that are befitting of God, that do not make God no longer God. Because if we say and just take it in its openness, God can do all things, then we can say then God could die. Or God could be born. And if you say God could be born, meaning that God would not exist and then come into existence, this is something which is inconceivable. So when we use the term, God is able to do all things, it is within the context of God, meaning God can do all godly things, things which are befitting of God. Uh, next question to Dr. John Limon. Sister first. Excuse me. Yeah, okay. Rahman Rahim. Uh, God created Satan. Mm -hmm. So why should he like, he have to pay a ransom to Satan in order to save mankind? Why can't he just destroy Satan just like he created him? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> it could have, but didn't. I mean, I... I, I him a rival to Satan. Uh, no, not really. Not, not, not an equal rival to, no, to Satan. Um, yeah, all of these questions have... You know, I could say, why didn't, you know, God make... Uh, humanity perfect from the beginning with no chance of, of uh, I mean, and I could ask the same thing of Islam. Why, why didn't God make uh, humanity sinless from the beginning until now? 
no chance of being uh, you know, sinful. We could ask that question. Uh, Islam has an answer, I'm sure. So does Christianity. But the question still remains, why not? The only answer to it is, we don't know why. We only know that that's what happened. We only believe that that's what happened. Uh, and so there is, that, that's my only answer for you. Yeah, I can't tell you, I can't tell you why. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Dr. John, thank you. Next question to Dr. Bilal Phillips. Yes, please. Thank you for your lecture here, it's very interesting. Um, you said that Christianity was mainly inter interpreted through Paul, but you meant that your um, opinions agreed with Jesus. And um, John Lamont, he would also say, uh, we Christianity is what Jesus taught. So the question here is really how to understand the teaching of Jesus. And my question is, Jesus said, I'm the Father, we are one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. Uh, isn't there something that, how would you respond to that according to your Muslim understanding? Uh, the statement, of course, I mean, and I wouldn't go into trying to um, interpret, uh, you know, biblical passages, because once you step into that uh, slippery slope, you know, we have many, many, many different possible interpretations. But um, uh, Jesus said, I am God are one. He also said to the disciples that you and I are one. So this concept obviously is not to be taken literally, but this is a figurative statement. One in will, that the prophets followed the will of God. As uh, it is stated in the Quran, for example, with regards to Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon all the prophets, that if you obey the prophet, you have obeyed God. And that's what we believe. Those who obey Jesus obeyed God. So they were one in terms of will. Jesus submitted to the will of God, and there are many statements to that effect. And there, that's where the oneness was. The other statement that you mentioned, um, I am the way, all of the prophets were the way. Each prophet, and you can find this in the Old Testament, reference way, reference to Moses, etc., the prophet, prophets brought the way. In, in Islam, we have to believe in the Quran and the Sunnah. This is this term that is used, the Sunnah. Sunnah actually means way, the way of the prophet. All prophets, when they came, identified for people the way to God. So Jesus was the way. The truth in that the teachings that he brought were the embodiment of truth. And this is the same thing what, that Muhammad brought, that, that Moses brought, may God's peace and blessing be upon all of them. They all brought the embodiment of the truth which came from God. So they were all the way, the truth, and in following that way, in truth, you would attain everlasting life. Meaning, not in hell, but in paradise. So that would be my interpretation. Okay. We will uh, uh, pose another question to Dr. Bilal Phillips until uh, Dr. John return, inshallah. Any more questions to Dr. Bilal? Yes. I just want to ask him, uh, Islam, if we do something wrong to another person, and if this person doesn't forgive us, how, how do you attain salvation? Uh, are we going to get some of his sins in the end or something like that? Well, uh, in terms of forgiveness, you know, Allah states there that He can forgive, you know, all sins. The only unforgivable sin is to worship others besides Him. If a person dies in that state, other sins can be forgiven by God. Uh, the person who you sinned against, um, that 
person may take from your good deeds on the day of judgment as a, as a means of retribution because God is just. But still, in the end, forgiveness is with God. لا يغفر الذنوب إلا الله That no one forgives sin ultimately but God. Thank you. Next question to Dr. John. Just, we have another one. I, Raise up the hand. I think uh, she's been putting her... Oh, is it? I haven't seen her. I'm sorry. Me. She's, you know, our assistant. <laughs> I just want to ask, um, normally we Christians and Muslims believe in submission to God and the word Islam in Arabic is meaning is submission to God. Mm -hmm. So from the ways of submission is praying, praying to God in the way of praying. Mm -hmm. Actually now I'm, I'm reading in the Bible in Arabic uh, and I see some verses just seeing that Jesus was praying to God uh, and just brought through on, on, on his face to the ground. If this is the same way as Muslims praying, <laughs> mm -hmm. so why Christians don't pr don't pray the same way as Jesus was praying? Uh, you read this in the Quran. No, no, in the Bible. In the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that Jesus put his face on the ground. Yeah. I can say it in Arabic, but I don't know what I mean. No, that's okay. I believe you. It's yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I have to look at uh, the quotation. It, you says, it says that uh, it's, it was before the, the, the crucifixion part. He said, wait, I, I know that number. Oh, you know it. Okay. He asked his disciple to go a little further and he fell on his face and prayed. Fully yeah, yeah, this is uh, yeah, Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Yes. Yeah. Um, you're, you're certainly welcome to pray that way. Christians may, may pray that way, fall on their face. Uh, but I, I don't think there was any, I mean, when Jesus did that, there was no command that followed it to do his disciples to say, as you see me praying, you also pray this way. There was, but as you say, he's got praying to teach you how to pray. No, no, no counter. No counter, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so I would say that there is no command of Jesus to his disciples to follow that. He, Jesus, I mean, the disciples did ask Jesus, how should we pray? And Jesus uh, then did not answer by saying, you know, fall on your face uh, and, uh, toward, uh, toward Jerusalem and, and pray. Uh, he gave them the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Sister, sister, please, please. Yeah. One question is allowed and no, no contact. So, He's now answering. So, so, that's, so that's my answer. That in, in the Bible, when, when the disciples specifically asked Jesus, how should we pray? Jesus gave them this the Lord's Prayer. And we would say, you don't even have to pray the Lord's Prayer. This was a model for prayer. It was not an absolute requirement that you pray the Lord's Prayer. It was a model for prayer. Yeah. Thank it's hard, you. isn't it? It's yeah. hard to, yeah. It's okay, Sister, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have next debate will be between Sister Nada and Dr. John. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very next much. Next question, also for Dr. John, because we have given two questions. Oh, okay. When uh, you were upset. Okay. Brother? Thank you, uh, Reverend John Lamont. I, I used to work with the, with the NL liner and uh, we have a few aircraft from Boeing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So what happened is they have all the pilots on train and they seriously train every three months, six months. They even have a Boeing representative sitting in the, in the office and everything because uh, we have so many aircrafts and we comes with manuals and manuals. It's so detailed because it involves a lot of lives. If this salvation would involve me going to hell and heaven and so the rest of the human, humankind, is so serious why is not being detailed in the Bible thank you yeah yeah I mean that's an interesting question if I mean I don't know if, if you heard exactly what he was saying but he used to work uh, for an airline and uh, that they dealt with Boeing the Boeing corporation 
and Boeing and training its pilots and training others, mechanics and things like that, they have stacks and stacks of very detailed instructions on what you have to do in order to maintain those airplanes, how to fly those airplanes, uh, because people's lives are at stake. Well, if it's true for airplanes, then shouldn't it be even more true, very specific uh, instructions for people uh, and their, their eternal salvation, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't, uh, I'm a, I, I'll put it this way, I'm, I mean, you can answer that. that, that is really a Muslim question. You know, it's not a Christian question. Uh, I mean, that's not, nothing wrong with being a Muslim question. You know, that, that's, that is, I tell my students at the seminary sometimes, they ask a question about another religion, and I say, that's a Christian question. You know, Buddhists don't ask that question. And I would say that about Christians, that, that we, we have the answer. The answer is very clear. Uh, believe in Jesus Christ, you know, follow Jesus Christ, and you uh, have salvation. That is through Jesus Christ, life, death, and resurrection, that salvation is achieved. It's very clear. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have reams and reams of uh, clear instructions. It's very simple. And uh, although there are a lot of different ways of understanding that, uh, from a Christian point of view, it's, it is quite clear. Yeah. But I, but I understand your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. As, as uh, only a few minutes are remaining, we would request Dr. Bilal Phillips and Dr. John to just give one minute each to address the audience regarding the same topic. What do you want them to do in order to be safe? One minute, you have one minute to advise our audience. Uh, just a conclusion. A conclusion before we end up the session, inshallah. Uh, what do I want you to do to be saved? Uh, I think... Um, there is no swimming pool here. No swimming pool here. Uh, be honest with yourself and with God. Be honest with yourself and with God. Uh, love God as much as you can. I would disagree that you can love God enough uh, to achieve salvation. I don't believe that. But I would say love God. Love your neighbor. Live a good life. Uh, from a Christian point of view, uh, Jesus is very important. Would I, would I like for you to become a Christian? Uh, not really. Uh, because I don't want you just to become a Christian in order to have your life to live eternally to save yourself from going to hell. I would like for you to be a Christian to experience the love and the joy that I experience from being a Christian, knowing Jesus Christ as my friend, my savior, uh, my shepherd, my, my physician, all of those things. I would encourage you to meet Jesus Christ in that way, uh, but not just to be a Christian, uh, to... Uh, prevent yourself from going to hell. Love God, love your neighbor. Thank you. Well, for me, I would say um, you better become Muslims. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I can't help you on that day. <laughs> But um, I would say to Muslims, first and foremost, that Islam cannot be inherited. This is something that Muslims sometimes uh, mistakenly understand that Islam, you know, I'm a Muslim because my parents were Muslims and my family, my country, whatever. Islam cannot be inherited. We can inherit names. We can inherit... Uh, property, uh, we can inherit culture, but we can't inherit Islam because Islam means submission to the will of God. And this is something which is a spiritual act which each and every believer has to do, has to achieve for them to be truly believers. And this is something which I also would 
uh, pass on to our Christian guests here that the submission to the will of God is the essence of worship. That is really the most critical issue. That you should use the intelligence which God has given, study your religion, its history, its evolution, especially the early centuries, the first five centuries, how it evolved and then ask yourself was this really from God or was this from man? God's religion doesn't evolve. God who created human beings in the time of Adam created them and knew what they needed their nature hasn't changed. We are no different from Adam. All these centuries, he created one human race. As he is one God, he created one human race. And he gave that human race one religion. We need to know that religion. The religion of Adam. and of all the prophets of God. Barakallah, may God bless you all. At the end, we thank you so much for coming. We uh, really enjoyed the talk by Dr. John Limond and Dr. Bilal Phillips. And we actually uh, eager to see a big hug between both. <laughs> yeah.